Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Engineering Entrepreneur Podcast. This is episode 105, and this is your host, Scott Tursty, and I run caddesignhelp.com, where we help you inventors out there with your product design and prototypes. Before we get started, please sign up my email list, again, caddesignhelp.com, and then you will be kept updated with everything. Leave me a review on iTunes, and send me an email if you have any feedback or requests, info at caddesignhelp.com. All right, our guest this week is Ryan Frederick, and he's a founder and product person at heart. He's had the privilege of being part of starting and growing several software and service companies over the years. And currently, he leads an elite team of 70 product designers and data problem solvers at AWH, and he can tell us more about that in a minute. So, Ryan, again, thanks for coming on the show. Now, when I think of products, I think of physical products. Is that the kind of products that you have built in the past or are we talking software products here or both? Yeah, really both. But, you know, product for better or for worse has sort of gotten commandeered in the, in the software space as referring to software products fundamentally and not, you know, tangible physical products. So we work on physical products that are connected, right. And that are IOT products and have some, you know, data software, app component and then certainly standalone software products. But uh, yeah, I, I think about five years ago, products sort of got commandeered by the software spaces. When when someone refers to product, they're often now referring to a software product and not physical products, which I'm not sure that's a, a, a good thing, but it's kind of the way that things have evolved. I mean, I think it depends on the industry. And I mean, when somebody talks to me about designing their product, most of them don't mean software. Um, so it kind of depends on the circles that you're in, but I guess let's start with your first, your first company or your first product that you worked on. Tell us the story on that. Yeah, it was a online service and it was kind of a mini Lexus Nexus that we had an online service that we accessed some, some public records from the feds, from States, some counties, and we made that available to attorneys and it was going okay. You know, and it, this was, you know, pre, you know, internet, you know, widely being available, frankly, and most people still using some sort of an ISP to get online. So still the days of AOL and CompuServe, et cetera. Um, so this really dates me. This is back in the sort of early to, you know, to mid late nineties was, was our run with this. And um, we had a very fortuitous thing happen uh, that changed the trajectory of the product and the company. We were targeting the service at attorneys and we were at a conference for uh, attorneys and and security people and a a guy that was in charge of security for the limited stopped by our exhibit and said, show me what you got. And so I gave him a little demo and he, and he said, uh, is there any reason why I couldn't use this for pre-employment background checks, right. And initial screenings for, you know, our retail associates, you know, for our limited stores. And I said, well, that's not how people use it right now. And that's not who we sell to. And he was like, well, is there any reason why we couldn't use it in that way? And I said, uh, again, that's not who we sell to. And he said, let me help you out. You know, why don't you come to my office in, in a couple of weeks and, and we'll talk more about it. And, you know, you can give me a more in-depth demo. So I did. And he ended up saying the real value here is not what you're currently positioning the product and the company as. And so we sort of pivoted, you know, as a, as part of that, and we grew in one year as fast as we had grown in the previous three years. You know, this guy before he, you go have a meeting with him and then you just take his word for this. It seems kind of crazy to go change your whole company based on something that one guy tells you, or did you find other people verifying the same thing that he was telling you? Oh yeah, verified it with others, but the order that we got from the limited, that what he signed up for and committed to was company changing. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, it wasn't just he saying suggesting it. He actually was like, I need this this much that I'm gonna place a massive order with you and it's worth changing everything around to make that work to, to, to fulfill that. Absolutely. Yeah. He he did not, it wasn't lip service. He said I'm going to use it in this way. I'm going to become a customer. This is what it means for you. And you should go talk to other people like me because this is where the real gravy is for you guys. And he was right. That's interesting. It almost seems like he should have said like for this amount of money, I want like 20% or something like some equity in it. Right. Because it's almost like because of him, the company changed and I don't know, maybe he couldn't negotiate with that. I just something that came to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 rarely happens because a customer, especially a customer at an enterprise, you know, like the limited, he's not thinking about 
oh, how can I get equity in a startup or how can the limited get equity in a startup? Because that would be a mess, right, for an enterprise to get involved in a startup from an equity position in most cases. He was just thinking about how do I add more value, right, to to the limited and how do I create more efficiency and reduce costs, et cetera. And so he was solely focused on how does he do his job better and how does he help the company advance? And what this must have been a long time ago because you're talking about this is like you couldn't access this like the stuff for the lawyers online. What what's the time frame are we talking here? Yeah, this is early to mid to late nineties. Yeah, I was, I was thinking it was like something around there. Yep. And how did you first how did you first get started even in the very first place of, of providing this this service? Are you a software developer where you could write some code to solve a problem and that's kind of how it started? Yeah, I'm a developer by training and then but realized that I that I didn't actually enjoy, didn't thrive uh, writing lines of code and, and staring at a screen all day. So I gravitated over to the business side. And then this company was a, a weird amalgamation of the Ohio, St- Ohio State Bar Association. And that's why we why we initially focused it on attorneys as our primary market, because our, one of our investors and, and a board member was the Ohio State Bar Association and some um, investors from Wichita, Kansas. They happened to be, uh, had a prior business relationship with the then president of the Ohio State Bar Association. So it was all sort of incestuous. Um, and, but that was the, the, that was sort of the underpinnings of the company and then, you know, we realized once we you know, made this pivot, right, with, with it, th- that we could change our approach to the market. And really to the, pro- we didn't actually have to change the product that much. The product didn't really change because we were an online service to this data. We just kept remaining an online service to this data. So the product didn't pivot very much, just who we targeted and who we marketed to pivoted. So that was a pretty easy pivot because we just had to change messaging, right? We just had to change who we were going after and we didn't have to change the product. And that's probably why we made it through it, right? If we had, if we had had to change the product massively to then follow this different market, we may have died in the process because a lot of products and companies do die in the process of that big of a redirection. We didn't have to change the product. We just had to change who we were selling it to. Yeah, for sure. And so when you were doing this, did you hire a lot of developers to do the coding while you ran the business? No, we actually ended up with, with I think we had three developers on our team and, you know, that was it. And um, we just ran with those three developers and, and until the company got acquired seven years later and we didn't, we never outsourced anything, but we also didn't have a massive development team. I will say looking back, the user experience was terrible. The, the user interface was terrible. This was very much a developer led product and But we didn't even know enough at that point to have the, because again, we were sort of on the bleeding edge because there weren't even these kinds of online services and access to this kind of data at the time that we were doing it. So the user experience didn't frankly matter that much because you only had certain ways to get to the data and you could either send someone to a courthouse or you could access the data through an online service like ours. And those were really your only options. And so the, the value proposition was so great that, you know, we basically were green screens through a browser versus green screens through a terminal. And, you know, now we would go back and we would look at that user experience and UI and be embarrassed by it. But at the time it was, it was perfectly appropriate based upon what the product was and, and, and what it was doing for people. Yeah, very interesting. One thing that always comes to mind and a lot of people have this question is, so for you to start a software business like this, how you had a background as a developer and you went to school for it. Do you think that's a necessary thing or can anybody, you know, who has an idea can, can just source these people to build it for you? I mean, there's a lot more to it in the sense, as I've looked at this myself, where you have to really clearly explain to any engineer software or mechanical like myself, what it is you want. You you can't be vague or they're going to have to make a lot of assumptions, but I'm curious on your opinion of somebody who's not an expert or didn't go to school for software development, going ahead and creating a product like you did here. Yeah, we have uh, at the product firm, I'm I'm now a partner at AWH. We have lots of of clients who 
are not developers, not dev- designers, not software product people, or even on the, the IoT hardware product side, they might be you know, a clinician, right? That's now figured out some some way to, you know, do something more efficiently with a connected piece of hardware than than doing it on on paper or with some other device and physical product that's doing, you know, the same thing now. And and th- they don't have, you know, technical backgrounds and, and product design backgrounds. And so that's certainly not a prerequisite. I think the prerequisite for me has always been how well do you understand the problem? And if you understand the problem at at an expert level, you can then work with a team of experts, right, in in disciplines that you don't have to then bring bring a solution to that problem, you know, through a physical product as you guys do or through a software product because it's really a great product is sort of that intersection of the ability to, you know, bring that product to life but the problem understanding, right, that then sort of drives the solution inside of the product. So I don't think you need to be an expert in the technical side, but I do think that you absolutely need to be a subject matter expert around the problem that's getting solved. Yeah, I agree with that because, you know, if, if you are an expert in the problem, like a lot of people say, like a lot of inventors, that, well, if you solve it for yourself, you're probably solving it for many other people also and so like if you just go out and solve your own problems it's unlikely that you are the only one who has that like for example one of the products i developed was a plug for the yeti cup because i got this cup as a gift and i was carrying it around in a backpack like on the side it was splashing water out and i just was like this is maddening i mean again everything's getting all wet and it was very simple design it still took a couple iterations even for something that simple to get it perfect but just 3d printed this plug and you know then improved it from there but then I went and sold it online because I was like, I bet a lot of other people have this issue because there's just this open hole here. This is before they made the sliding version. Um, but I still get orders even today because people have the old lids. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people had that problem. But it all started because I wouldn't say I'm an expert in it, all things Yeti Cup related, but it's you know it's a simple problem that I had and I knew how to solve it. And so, yeah, I think anybody that getting into more complex things, even regarding software, if you can find the problem that you have and just in an industry, good chances a lot of other people in your industry are going to have it too. And if you solve that, you might be on to something. Yeah. And I think, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm very much a problem sort of centric person versus an idea centric person, because I've been around long enough where, you know, lots of people have, you know, varying ideas, some of that are atrocious and some, you know, that, that may have great potential, but if if you, if you are sort of obsessed with and and you've got validation of a real problem that that you have and that likely other people have or you've been living with the problem for you know a decade or more you know that that that's where you know that's a that's a better bet than someone who's got an idea right who who now needs to convince other people that their idea is worth pursuing and is somehow attached to a problem that people care about so i think you have idea people and you have problem centric people and i think the problem centric is is a better bet every day of the week yeah that's a very good point and so now talking about your current firm, a uh, AWH. So are you, you guys are service providers that will, um, if somebody has something they want, it's it's sort of like mine, but more from the software side, right? You, you'll develop everything they need to to bring this to market. I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I and yeah, I think it is it is sort of the same side of or the different side of the same coin in that you're working with product creators from a you know tangible physical product perspective, and we're working with people from a software perspective. And you know, some of them come to us with a blurry vision of what they want to accomplish, and what they really got to do is sort of give us the the context around the problem that they that they're trying to solve, and and then we can sort of fill in the gaps. And some of us, some people come to us with very clear and well articulated problems and and we and we just need to start you know digging in with them around you know designing and developing it and i'm sure you experienced the same thing you know from a, a tangible product perspective and so we've got a team you know that ranges from business analysts and product managers to designers and developers and and testers you know etc and 
it, it's there, no one needs more. And, and this sometimes gets me in trouble because, you know, I now own a, a, you know, a software product consulting firm, but I don't think the world doesn't need more software, but the world certainly needs more software that can solve problems that, that are best solved through software. But I still see a lot of software and a lot of apps getting built that, it is getting built for the sake of it getting built because we can design and build it when it's not really oriented and grounded in what problem are we solving? Who are we solving it for? And why are they, why do they care about it? And so we're pretty, we're pretty selective on the projects and the clients that we engage with because we want our work to stand for something and to be, you know, representative of, of being good work as a service firm, as, as you know, your work is who you are, right? Your record is what you, you know, what it says you are based upon what you've done, you know, prior. So we tend to not dig in just because somebody wants to build something. We want to assess whether, you know, there's a real problem at hand here and, and we want to get context of how well do they understand the problem? Cause that's probably going to drive how successful the product is not how well or not how well designed or built it is something being well designed and well built now in software is a given it's really how well did you understand the problem to build something that people value and want to use yeah yeah i totally understand that and when somebody hires you do you just do it for a fee or do you do it for equity or or a mix I'm kind of curious on that yeah mostly for a fee we, we have some engagements where we have equity participation we started financing some clients and some client work probably four years ago. And now we have several of those engagements and we really did it out of necessity. We had a couple of startup clients that were either in between funding rounds or had raised a round, but were struggling to raise their next round. But we were like chest deep in, in the product work. And it was like, okay, we either have to just stop working on the product or we've got to figure out a way to keep working on the product because if we don't keep working on the product, they're not going to raise their next round. So it would then sort of make it off or not. And so we started fin financing some client work because of those situations. And then I would say two years ago, the pre-seed funding uh, really across the globe started to, to get wonky and started to dry up uh, because it's hard to make, it's hard for investors to make money in early stage investing because they can't put a, a ready to big enough check into a company to get a return for all of the other investments they're making that early. And so the numbers just don't really work often in the sort of early stage investing in startups. And so we started financing some of the work. And so, you know, that's been good and it's worked out for us and it's worked out for our clients that we've done that for, because it extends their runway because now they can have us crank on the product while they're out signing up customers, marketing the product, maybe still talking to investors about raising money and their, you know, terms for us, you know, have been spread over time. So it gives them a little bit more runway than they otherwise would have. And in some cases, it's actually saved some companies and, and some companies and products have seen the light of day because of it. Okay. So you basically make a judgment call. You say, we think that this guys have a, have a solid product here. Or they're, they're, the problem that they're really the essential thing is the problem that they're solving is definitely worthy of it. And if we fund this now and they pay us back later, like it's going to be well worth our time. Or alternatively, we fund it and get some percentage of the, of the return on the product, you know, a royalty payment, or when they exit, we get that like in the future. But if that comes down to a business analysis, and I'm assuming that you get pretty involved at that point. Yeah, I do. And, and it does. Um, because they're often, you know, too early to have any track record around, you know, the certainty of it working. Um, but what I end up gravitating back to is how well do they understand the problem and, and, and why is that? What's their expertise around the problem? And are they likely to then to be able to take the product that we're going to build for them to market and actually build a commercial enterprise, right? Or, around and on top of the product. That's really what I'm looking for in assessing. So in some ways, we're looking at these opportunities and these clients that we either do financing for or take equity in. We're looking at it very much, you know, through the eyes of an investor of, is this a good return and are we likely to get a return? And for me, it comes back to the problem and their, their awareness around the problem. Yeah, exactly. And how do you actually do that kind of analysis? And another thing that I would do is I would 
be looking at the target market, right? And doing my own due diligence in the sense of like, okay, the customers that would be buying this, let me go talk to them and maybe do a non-disclosure or something if you need to, but show them what, what you've done so far, show them like what the problem is going to solve and kind of get their feedback. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd almost pre-sell it, right? Where you would fake that it's finished and see how many sales you get. Everything that, from my understanding, is it's, it's always better to get to they actually put their credit card down versus just saying that they will. But maybe that's not always possible. Do you do any kind of testing like this for decisions to, to go and invest in something? Yeah, we do. And, and in some cases, you know, and that's one of the questions that, that we'll have for a potential client is what, you know, what customer validation have they already done? What commitments do they already have? If any, if they don't, then we'll, we'll sort of press them for those. And, and we might go out and, and do some of our own validation around it. Uh, but we have a client uh, that, that just came to mind that they ran a services firm for 12 years and they, they essentially ran the services firm on this series of spreadsheets. And they came to us and, and, and said, hey, we think you know, that there might be an opportunity to build a product and basically then allow their clients to do what they were doing on behalf of these spreadsheets in a self-service way. And, and I looked at it and said, okay, how long have you been in business and how long have you been doing this? 12 years. Okay, so you understand this problem really well. You have these spreadsheets in place that are essentially a product that isn't yet a product, right? But it, it's you have at least processes down and algorithms and calculations down in the spreadsheets that could get productized. And then when I said, well, what do you think the the interest of, of your customers is to do this in, in a self-service way? And they said, well, we've already got 10 commitments. And I was like, oh, okay. You, like they've already like signed a piece of paper and they said, yeah, and they showed me and they were like, yeah, people, people really want this. And I was like, all right, let's do this. So there are some, right, that, that the stack, the validation stack, pretty clear and obvious, and that was one of them. And then there are others that require a lot more due diligence and a lot more work and massaging on every layer of the stack to figure out what, whether it makes sense or not. That's one that just checked all the boxes really quickly because they had been thinking about productizing their internal spreadsheet process for 10 of the 12 years. They just never really had the stomach to sort of pursue it and, until you know, they had this sort of conscious awareness to say, all right, you know, we're gonna we're now gonna take this on. But they had they had all the bricks, right? They just need help, they just needed help somebody picking the bricks up and and actually making a wall out of it. Uh, yeah, that's a good example. And to me, it seems like the first step of any adventure, right, of the building product is first validate the, that there is a market. Like even my Yeti plug example, if I wasn't doing it for myself and I thought it was a problem for other people, like if I didn't know for a fact it was a problem. Like I certainly would be asking people before I go spending time and money developing it just because how much of a problem is it? Just one person want this or do 10,000 people want it? Right? That, that really matters a lot. Percentage of people actually do that before they start building something. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm very, you know, much a, you know, validate the problem and, and validate how much people care about the problem and how much, you know, they're willing to potentially spend to solve the problem for themselves or their organization. And I was speaking at a conference a couple of years ago and I was sort of, you know, you know, rattling on about, you know, being problem centric and, and doing a lot of, you know, and being very customer intimate, right. And, and doing a lot of this validation work and a guy stood up and he was like, well, how do you explain like Steve jobs and Elon Musk and, you know, visionaries who, who, you know, they tell their customers kind of what they want. Right. And I was, and I just said to the guy, I, I said, I don't know about you, but I'm not Steve Jobs and I'm not Elon Musk. So I'd rather bet on doing the customer validation and the problem validation than betting on the fact that I know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. And really those guys like the iPhone, it, it solved a lot of problems. He just thought of it in a really different way than anybody had before. That's all it is. It, he's still, there was still the problem of like, you want to get internet on your phone, right? That's a, a thing that people want. It's they, I'm trying to think of like the original first iPhone. I remember seeing it like these real nerdy guys that were in a bar were all like looking at this thing. And I thought, I didn't think, I think it was that impressed. And now I've had an iPhone for years, but this is like way back in like 2005, probably when the first iPhone came out. But 
I think the whole point of that is like they still were solving a problem. He just did it in a radically different way. And I think that's why and did so much at once that was so much better than everything before it is the reason that it was so successful. It's not that they just assumed that everybody wanted this, like if they had to have data on it or it's just maybe obvious, but that's just my assumption. Yeah, I agree. And I think that some problems are, you know, more obvious than others and, you know, and, and we're all biased. Right. And so, you know, I, I've been a part of starting companies and building products in very niche spaces. Um, another product and company that I was a part of is we built a CRM for blood centers to manage their blood donors. And there, there are a finite number of blood centers in the world. So we knew the market was, was really small, but it's highly regulated, very conservative industry. And so we knew that, that uh, if we built a product in that, in that space that was better, that we would have an opportunity to, to have a really good business being one of the key players in the space. And, and we did, and, and, and it went well. But that's not the kind of a, a business and a product that most investors are going to get excited about. It's not going to make the cover of Fast Company, you know, et cetera. And so I'm sort of biased in that I, I tend to lean toward problem understanding and customer validation and thinking about, you know, could this be, you know, a, a profitable enterprise even if we only signed up a hundred customers, right? If it's a B2B, right? Is that sustainable? And is that a good business? And if it is, all right, cool. And, and where some other problems that are maybe a little bit more obvious and that are much, you know, have much bigger potential, you know, also have a lot more risk associated to them. Because if you say, Hey, I think, you know, consumers would really dig, you know, a new phone that played music and allowed them to browse the web and did some of the things better in one package. If you nail it, awesome. But if you don't, right, you know, it's going to be, you know, a, a, a flame out of epic proportions. Um, and so I'm biased based upon my experiences, having some success in doing it one way. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It doesn't mean it's the right way. It just means I'm biased by that. Yeah, I understand that. Before we run out of time here, Ryan, I know you have a new book out and I wanted to touch base on that as well. Yeah. So I've got two books out now. The the newest one just released on Monday. So the first one is the founder's manual and I wrote it just to some, you know, put some principles down on paper that I think people need to be aware of if they're going to think about starting a company and, and building a product and being a new founder. And then the one that just came out on Monday is called Sell Naked, and it's about growing and managing a services firm and the differences between operating a services firm and growing it successfully versus uh, starting and running a product company. So they're both available on Amazon, and if one, either one of those resonates with people and, and they want to check it out, uh, I would be grateful. Yeah, very cool. Um, there's a podcast that I recommend called The Tropical NBA, and they talk about difference between product and service companies and the pros and cons of each. You know, it's always a good uh, discussion there. Well, that's about all I've got. I always have two last questions for my guests. Uh, the first one is, what's your number one tip for aspiring entrepreneurs? I would say that it, 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 this is going to be um, maybe also a little controversial. Probably don't do it. Look, most things don't work. Most products don't work. Most companies don't work. And if you're going to do it, do it for the right reasons. Don't do it for ego. Don't do, do it because you think you're going to make a killing financially because you're probably going to be broke before you make any money. And if you if you don't, if, and again, back to the problem, if you don't have a problem that you feel compelled and and qualified to solve, then, you know, anybody can call themselves a founder and change their LinkedIn, you know, uh, headline to say founder or entrepreneur, that's the least important part of it. The most important part is it, have you identified a problem that's worth solving that you're, you, that you have the capacity to solve? Yeah. That's interesting advice in the sense of don't do it. But I mean, it is true that it's not going to be easy and you have to be doing it for more than just the money or like the, you have to enjoy the process at least at a minimum, right? Like when I first started my business, i I did it on the side when I was working full time. Yeah. I mean, I was obviously getting paid for 
the work I landed, but you know, there was a lot of work that I didn't get paid for like quotes I sent in that I never got hired for building the website cost me money. It didn't generate money. Like a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff you have to do, but I was really motivated to do it. I really wanted to be my own boss for basically six months. I worked 80 hours a week uh, between the full-time job and, and was my side hustle at the time because I really wanted it that bad. And I, I like doing this type of work too. So it's like when I actually got the design work and doing that part of the job, I actually enjoyed the business side, not so much, but it was something, you know, you have to take care of. So it's kind of my story on that anyways. Yeah. And I agree. I think you have to, you have to enjoy the grind and you have to enjoy the process um, because if you don't, you're probably not going to see it through there, there is, you're going to put way more into it early on than you're going to get out of it. And if you don't enjoy the process and if you don't enjoy the work, right, then it's, it's probably, you're just going to, you're just going to fatigue, right. You know, through the process. And I think that a lot of people just aren't aware of that existence and what it re you know, being an entrepreneur and a founder now is, is romanticized and it's glamorized and, you know, it's, it's, you know, Zuckerberg, when he was at Harvard, you know, building, you know, hot, hot or not for a Harvard dorm room, had no idea that he was creating the underpinnings of what would become Facebook. And so people also need to keep in mind that some people that are held up on a pedestal now as, as super successful founders and entrepreneurs didn't start there. Yeah, there's a lot of luck involved in it. And, and that's the thing. And you got to really take the chance because I mean, the odds are not in your favor, but if you don't try at all, then it'll never happen for sure. So, but you have to be realistic at the same time. Last question. Um, people want to get in contact with you or learn more about your company. What's the best way? Yeah. The, uh, AWH site is awh.net. And then my personal page is Ryan Frederick biz B I Z. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we'll put those in the show notes. That's all I got. Hey, man, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And we'll catch everyone next time on the podcast. 